Hello and welcome to the broadcast. It is so good to be with you once again. Uh, today's broadcast is going to be a blessing to you. I have a very special friend, Bill Federer, who is no stranger here at Church for All Nations or Victorious Faith. And we're going to have an awesome conversation. I want to encourage you, though, stay with us through the whole broadcast because we'd love to pray with you. And uh, right now, I want to welcome our special guest, Bill Federer. Bill, thank you for being with us on the broadcast today. Mark, great to be with you. Well, you know, we could spend literally hours, days, weeks, months, and maybe years talking about some of the books that you've written, which I think are so valuable and important. And, you know, you're known as one of the greatest historians. And uh, what I love about your books is you take history and then really you tie it in to how really history does, in fact, repeat itself. We were talking about this the other day that really it's human nature that doesn't change. And because of that, that's why we see history repeating itself. But I've got here in my hands a book that you wrote called Who is the King? The subtitle, And Who Are the Counselors to the King? And this is really an overview of 6,000 years of history and why America is so unique. Tell us about this book. Well, I had an idea years ago that I would read through every single century of recorded human history to try to find out what the most common form of government is. And so go, go back to uh, Sumerian cuneiform on clay tablets in the Mesopotamia Valley. Now, I do not read Sumerian, but you read the books about it. Um, and you have, and that's around 3300 BC. So uh, you even have uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson, and he's an astrophysicist. And years ago, he had his Cosmos TV series. And there was one episode where he's standing in the desert, and he says it was here around 5,000 years ago between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers that we learned how to write, we being humanity. And, of course, he was talking about it where you could accumulate knowledge and pass it to the next generation. And you have this cumulative effect of humanity getting smarter because instead of it just being what I could accumulate in my life and then I die and then a por smaller portion of that gets to my kids, you can write it down and you can have this, this compendium of, of human wisdom being passed along. And, and he was talking about how that helped with technological advancements later. But, but the point is he pointed out 3,300 years ago, around, around 5,000 BC, we're around 2080. So I was looking at it as what the most common form of government is. And the first record you have is um, uh, Nimrod Tower of Babel, right? The Plains of Shinar, which for those that study that uh, Middle Eastern geography, you have uh, Mount Ararat, uh, which is sort of around Turkey. And then coming down off of that is the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. And then they cause this Mesopotamian valley that em ends up in the Persian Gulf, where today Iraq, Iran, and and um, uh, Kuwait, you know, have their ports. And so um, Nimrod builds this tower. And according to Josephus, uh, it was the, the biggest structure that humans had ever made to this point. And more or less, it was the first attempt at a one world government. Wow. Because the population of the world, right, according to recorded history, was over there. And he wanted to control it. And he made everybody uh, in Babylon bake bricks and bring them. And uh, or he would kill him, so it was oppressive over man. And then Josephus said that he wanted to build the tower so high that if God destroyed the world again with a flood, he could survive on top. And so it was sort of this defiant in your face attitude. God comes down, confuses the languages, the people separate into language groups that turn into nations. Nations was God's way of postponing a one world government. You take the population of the world, you break it into different groups, and they'll compete with each other, sort of cancel each other out, uh, so you won't have this. But every generation, you have a king that wants to conquer other nations. And if left un unchecked, they would have continued to conquer, and any one of them could have been the Antichrist, right? And so you have, um, you know, uh, Bab Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, and then, you know, there's the... Uh, Cyrus of Persia, Alexander the Great, uh, Julius Caesar, Attila the Hun, Genghis Khan, uh, Napoleon. I mean, any one of them, if they hadn't died, they'd have been ha happy to keep conquering. 
So in that sense, death is a blessing and the devil has to go back and find some, somebody else and rebuild his structure. Now, human nature stays the, the same. St. Augustine called it a libido dominandi, the lust to dominate. And so the same way you have Cain killing Abel, you have one king taking a kingdom from another king. And as the years go on, the weapons improve. So the kings can conquer larger areas. And so instead of Cain killing Abel with a rock, they can now kill with bronze weapons or iron weapons or big long phalanx spears that the Greeks had or scimitar sword that the Muslims invented or gunpowder that the Chinese invented or directed energy weapons from satellites frying things. I mean, the, the weapon improves, but it's that same fall in nature of Cain killing Abel. And then with technological advancements, the kings can track more people. Around 2 BC, Augustus Caesar wanted to have a worldwide tracking system. It was called the census, a tax enrollment. If he could have had 5G and cell phones and facial recognition software, he'd probably have been tempted to use that. So these kingdoms keep getting bigger. Anybody that can plot on a graph sees that at some point it's going to max out on a global level. And Jesus says, wheat and tares grow together till the harvest. And, um, and it's sort of interesting. One of the things that I noticed is wherever you have a king, there are certain dynamics. A king is basically a glorified gang leader. Mm. So the default setting for human government is gangs. The first invention ever was the plow. Cain was a tiller of the soil, and then they started hitting each other with the plows and they turned into weapons. And then when people felt insecure, they would gather together and they would find somebody that knew how to fight better than the rest, and they would say, you be our captain. The Bible even has the story of during the Israel Republic period before King Saul. You had this 400 year period, no king. And they were being invaded and the elders went to Jephthah, who was an outcast. And they said, come be our captain. We're being invaded. Well, you, he goes, you, you kicked me out. Why do you, but well, you're really good at fighting, <laughs> right? And so what would happen is whether you would have these people fighting and they would survive and that's a good thing. But then everybody would be grateful to this guy and his family, and then it would begin to turn into a political family where that you'd, everybody wants their, their, their favor, and then it turns into a political machine, and then it turns into having a king. And everybody in town would have to kiss up to this guy or else they're kicked out of town or ostracized or killed. And so as the weapon improves, the kingdoms get bigger. And if you're friends with the king, you're more equal. If you're not friends with the king, you're less equal. You're an enemy of the king, you're dead. <laughs> And, um, but it's in human nature. So um, I tell people, imagine if you were the king. That'd be pretty nice. And then you have a sister that you really love, and she has a kid. Now the kid's a teenager, and he's hanging around the wrong friends, drinking and partying, and he hits someone with the car and kills him. And uh, your sister, and he, now he's facing prison time. And your sister comes begging to you and says, you're not going to let little Johnny get locked away, are you? It wasn't his fault. Those other kids talked him into it, blah, blah, blah. What are you going to say to your own sister? Well, I'll, I'll let little Johnny off the hook this time, but don't let it happen again. Guess what? As soon as you say that you are the corrupt dictator, you just sent ripples through your kingdom that if somebody's family or friends with the king, they get special treatment. They're not family and friends. They don't get it. And if they're wanting to point out your favoritism, you're going to be embarrassed and want to shut them up. It just happens. Power corrupts and absolute power corrupts. Absolutely. You know, Bill, you said something at the very start that I think it explains why you're so so much in demand as a speaker, uh, why uh, Church for All Nations here loves you so much. And every time you speak, people just talk about what you're sharing. Here you were going back thousands of years in the Tower of Babel and you said, here we see the first attempt at a one world government. And so history repeating itself, human nature being the same in its fallen state, then all of a sudden, now we just have a greater sophistication. In your book here, uh, the first chapter, this is the book, Who is a King? Which, by the way, I want to encourage everybody to visit uh, Bill Fetter's website, AmericanMinute.com. You have um, a regular daily American Minute, and it's so fascinating to read because you're going to learn things about history globally, in the world, and about America and you're going to learn things that are just incredible. But history is not man's idea. It's God's idea. And in the Old Testament and the New Testament, he commanded us to keep an account of what happened. He said to the children of Israel, write these things down. Teach them to your children. Then we jump over the New Testament 
And then the Lord says, hey, these, the word says, these things are written for your admonition and learning so you don't have to fall after the same example of unbelief. And then there's that saying, the only thing we learn from history repeating itself. <laughs> we, never, <laughs> we never learn from history repeating itself. But in this book, uh, Who is the King in America? Uh, the first chapter is, has America lost its memory? Have we lost our memory in America? Yeah, there's a great quote from uh, Arthur Schlesinger Jr. And it's, history is to the nation what memory is to the individual. So have you ever met an individual who has lost their memory? Maybe they have Alzheimer's, it's sort of sad, dementia. Uh, you can take anything away from them. Well, we sort of have national Alzheimer's. We've lost our wow. collective memory. And, um, and they're taking our freedoms away, away from us and we're just sort of staring off into space. And when you share these stories, the little flicker comes back into their eyes and like, you know, that, that's who we are. My mother-in-law, before she died, had Alzheimer's. And I remember being in the nursing home and visiting with her for about a half an hour. Right before I left, she looks up at me and she says, Bill? Like, if she, it was finally clicking, you know? And, and, um, and so when I share these stories with people, they're like, that's who we are as Americans? We're, we're sort of unique. We, we get to be in charge of our life. See, wherever there's a king, they rule through fear. That's what Nimrod wanted to get people to be more afraid of him than afraid of God. And so instead of the fear of God, you're afraid of this leader. And, and so, um, so all kings rule through fear. That's the energy. That's the electricity. Montesquieu was a French political philosopher quoted by the founding fathers, almost the number one most quoted person. But Montesquieu lived in France, wrote a book in 1761 called Spirit of the Laws. Uh, he divided the government into three groups, monarchs, despots, and, and republics. And republics, the people rule themselves, but they need to have virtue. And uh, kings, they rule through honor and shame. And you don't necessarily need, need to have virtue. Um, you'll do what maybe will be unvirtuous and be deceptive to defeat an enemy, and the king will honor you for it. And even though you did an unvirtuous thing, if you're honored for it, well, that's... So the kings motivate people through honor and shame. And the despots rule through uh, ple pain and pleasure. So, so sort of a positive negative. Um, in Chicago, they call it the bribe or the bullet, the silver or the lead. And so the, the republic, the, um, uh, you have your reward or punishment in the next life, right? Uh, the uh, king, um, the honor and shame is more, more of a mental soulish realm thing. So, uh, and then pain and pleasure is a physical thing. So it's sort of spirit, mind, and body, right? These are, mo so the Republic, you have spiritual motivations to be virtuous, and then, then there's this punishment in the next life, right, going to hell. Um, the honor, shame is mental, and then the, and so uh, it's interesting, Montesquieu said that Republics are most prevalent in Protestant countries. He says, monarchs are most prevalent in Catholic countries. He says, a religion with a visible head likes to have a government with a visible head. And he says, despots are most common in Muslim countries, like the Ottoman Empire. You do what the Sultan says, he gives you a harem of women. You don't do what he says, he chops your hand or your head off, right? Um, and it's interesting, there's three kings of united Israel, right? We, we, we read the Bible, we see Israel. Actually, there's only three kings. It was Saul, David, Solomon. And then Solomon's son, Rehoboam, and it split to the 10 northern tribes and the the southern tribes. And for the rest of Israel's history, it was never united. It was Israel and Judah, mm. right? But there's only three kings over the United Kingdom. And um, so uh, Saul is most noted for what? Head and shoulders by everybody else. Physically, he was, uh, that was his attribute. Um, David was most noted for what? His, his heart, heart after God. And Solomon was, was most noted for what? His mind, wisdom. And so, uh, Saul, right, he fell, um, and, and Solomon f fell, had married a thousand wives, God appeared to him twice, you know. David fell, but he repented. <laughs> and so, um, uh, so we're called to, to be following God after our own heart. But, but it's interesting, so we have these, the king is the norm, and uh, ancient Israel, when they come out of Egypt around 1400 BC, they don't have a king for 400 years. This is an anomaly. 
that it's the book of Judges, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1 Samuel, up until you anoint King Saul. This 400 year period of Israel's history, there's no king. And it's an anomaly, it's a unique situation in all of world history that we don't appreciate. We like a oh, book of Judges, sort of, you know, a little bit chaotic. You got Samson, you got this, you got, you know, killing the Benjamites. And, and, um, but when you zoom out, that was unique. Here you have millions of people from around 1400 BC to 1000 BC. You have a, a millions of people and there's no king. I um, was uh, watching a video. Is this okay? I know I'm sort of rambling. No, this is great. I, I want to point this out because what you're doing, Bill, is you're taking us back in history. We're learning that there's nothing new under the sun. And the book that we're really directing people toward is who is the king in America? Well, wait a minute. We're, we have a president, we've got the executive branch there, and, and then we've got the legislative and judicial. And so some people think, you know, this just kind of happened. But it's unique in all the world, and it really was inspired out of Scripture, Isaiah chapter 33. So what is it about America that makes us so unique in view of world history, and who is the king in America? Um, we are the people. We the people. The politicians are your servants. You vote them in, you vote them out. And where did they found? Where did our founders get the idea from? The New England pastors and their congregational okay, covenant form of government. Now, wait a minute. What about separation of church and state, Bill? Um, that is uh, that term's been twisted. So. Uh, the most common form of government's kings. The Reformation happens, and you have uh, kings killing percentages of their population for simply believing differently than the king. And so in the French-speaking area of Switzerland, you have a guy named John Calvin, and he says, we are subject to the men who rule over us, but subject only in the Lord. Mm -hmm. If they commend anything against him, let us not pay the least regard to it. In other words, you, you, Ephesians 6, children obey your parents. But what if there's a bad parent that tells the kid to sell themselves into prostitution and kill the neighbor? Is the kid supposed to obey that? No. The child obeys the parent as long as the parent's tell him to do something that lines up with God's word. You obey the government as long as the government's telling you to do something that lines up with God's word. I mean, why would God tell you to do something in his word and then tell you to submit to a government that tells you not to do what he just got done telling you to do? And so John Calvin develops this form of government uh, called the covenant form of government. And um, so, so the norm is kings, and if you get a, a bad king, you kick him out, but then there's chaos because there's no order. And everybody says, well, we need somebody to come and restore order, and you get another king. And then he's okay, and his son's halfway okay, and then his grandson's terrible, and he gets oppressive, and so you throw him out, and then it turns into this chaos, and then you say, we need somebody to come and restore order, and boom, you're back to a king. King's the norm. That's where the gravity pulls. A covenant form of government is a balancing act where you can take the power of the king and you separate it, but you keep it from snapping back because everybody's taught the law and everybody's personally accountable to God to follow the law. And that's what happened with ancient Israel. The priests would teach everybody, okay, there's a God who's watching everyone. He wants you to be fair and he's going to hold you accountable in the future. So you're about to steal something. Nobody's around. You know you can get away with it. And then you think God's watching me. Are you describing right there uh, what is called self-government? Uh, because am I correct in saying that America was really this experiment in self-government. Is that accurate? Yeah, and they looked back to the first 400 years out of Egypt before King Saul. So it's called the Hebrew Republic, and these Puritan scholars that studied it were nicknamed Christian Hebraists. Mm. You know, James Harrington, John Sadler, whose sister Ann Sadler married John Harvard, and that's why they taught Hebrew at Yale and Harvard. And they were fascinated with this period called the Hebrew Republic, where there's millions of people and no king. So there was this Egyptian steel, so it's S-T-E-L-E, -E. it's a, what they would call a monument where they would call, and these Egyptian pharaohs would like carve all their conquests in this one that was discovered and that would dated back to around 1300 BC. And so this would have been the children of Israel are in the promised land for a hundred years by now. And this stele, 
as the Pharaoh conquered the Canaanites and he had a little symbol for a king with this castle, right? And then the, he conquered the king of a Ashkelon, you know, and there's this little, and he conquered the king of, you know, whatever the other place was. And then it says he conquered into Israel and the symbol is the symbol for people. It's not the symbol. In other words, Israel's sort of unorganized. It's like we go in there and we fight people, but we're not quite sure who we're conquering. So even back then, the Egyptians, the world knows something strange going on in Israel. They're sort of ruling themselves and there's no king. And, um, and so this model called the Hebrew Republic worked until the priest stopped teaching the law. You think, what? Yeah, here's Eli, the high priest. His own sons are sleeping with women in the very tent where the Ark of the Covenant is. And then a uh, story in the book of Judges of a Levite with a silver graven image in the house of a guy named Micah. The tribe of Dan comes along, steals the graven image, tells this Levite, come along with us and you can be a priest to our whole tribe. And you're reading the story, scratching your head. What's this Levite doing with a graven image? Isn't it like one of the first commandments? You're not supposed to have them. He, so he, the Levites were not teaching the law. And then another story of a Levite with a concubine. The law says the Levite is to marry a virgin of his own tribe. Here he is with a woman he's not even married to. He's not following the law. And they're traveling and the house is surrounded by sodomites. Something about that behavior that appears at the last stages of a people ruling themselves. This casting off of self-restraint, this abandonment to passion, and the poor girls raped to death. And by the time you're grossed out, you read this line, every man did that which was right in their own eyes. Why? Because the priests had stopped teaching them what was right in the Lord's eyes. So they lost the awareness of God, the fear of God. They lost the knowledge of the law. All they had was their selfish human passions and it turned into this chaos. That's when they go to Samuel the prophet and they say, the self-government system's not working. We want to snap back like all the other countries and have a king. And this is why, Bill, um, your ministry is so important because a lot of times uh, Americans hear our history and they're in shock. So if you go back 1600s, you know, the reason we taught children to read is so they could read the Bible. We used the New England primer and, you know, that had biblical stuff in it. And you could actually have children removed from their home if they were not taught to read because they had this, this one particular law, the old deluder Satan act. And in other words, you would have your children taken out if they would not read because the law was if they can't read, they can't read the Bible. If they can't read the Bible, they have no defense against Satan. Is it true we are a Christian nation, and what does that mean? So it has different definitions. So the kings of Europe, they looked to the Bible for their authority, but they looked to the King Saul and on part of the Bible, the divine right of kings, the colonial founders of New England looked to the Bible for their authority, but they looked to the pre-King Saul period. There's 400 years, millions of people, no king. Everybody's taught the law. Everybody's personally accountable to God to follow the law. Can I interject? What is the divine right of kings? You know, the word says where the word of a king is, there's power. I don't even know if we can conceive that, but if the king said, hey, take his head off, we'd hear a thud shortly. What is a divine right of kings or how did they view that? Well, it goes back to the people going to Samuel uh, they said, we want a king, and Samuel cries, and the Lord tells him, they did not reject you, they rejected me. Mm. And the next day they show up, and they said, we sinned in asking for a king. And Samuel said, yeah, you did sin, and here's lightning and thunder destroying your crops. And they're like, oh, we were, so it's okay, God's still going to work his plan of redemption, but he's going to do it now through a king. And right, so they get King Saul, he rules like a tyrant, and then, you know, then they have David and on. Um, but then God still works his plan, and and so, but as far as the government, from that moment on, the people of Israel didn't rule themselves. It was now a top down. And it comes to an interesting scene where Saul is pouting that his son Jonathan became friends with David. And he turns to his soldiers and he says, none of you soldiers care about me. You know that David and Jonathan are friends and, you, and you're not telling me. Um, and one soldier, Doeg the Edomite, says, King, I'm your friend. I saw David go to this town called Nob, and the priest there gave him some bread and the sword of Goliath that was stored there. And uh, Saul says, bring those priests to me. They show up. He turns to his soldiers and says, kill them. The soldiers hesitate. And Doeg the Edomite says, I'll kill them. Goes out there and kills them all, about 70 of them. 
What just happened? The soldiers had been operating under the old system, the republic system, where each person is accountable to God to follow the law. And the law says you need two or more witnesses before you condemn somebody to death. And there's only one witness, Doeg. And these soldiers are like, okay, king, you're telling me to kill, and there's only, and I'm accountable to God, and God said there needs to be two witnesses and not one. And so they're hesitating. They have a conscience. Doeg says, King, I'm going to surrender my conscience to you. You tell me to kill, I'll kill. Tell me to kill the baby in the womb, I'll kill it. Tell me there's no more male and female, fine. Tell me whatever you want. I, I'm just mush, and I just carry out whatever the government tells me to do. I surrender myself to Nimrod. <laughs> so really, whatever the king fancied, that was the law. That was it, so to speak. Yeah, and, and so that's why um, God was upset at kings when they would do something wrong and send prophets to them and tell them to repent. Like when David took a census, um, and David's like, I'm the one that sinned, you know. But, um, but before then, the people were the king. Now, in Israel, they just called it the congregation of the Israelites or the assembly of the Israelites. And each town got to elect their own elders. They, it wasn't a king sending somebody to the town saying, I'm ruling in the name of the king. Do what I say here. I'm, I'm, Caesar sent me here. You know, No, it's the it, Moses said, you know the people that hate covetousness, that you just can't bribe with anything. And he says, you, you choose from amongst yourselves people that are honest. And, um, uh, and so in every town, you will pick these elders and you'll have them sit by the gates. And whenever there's an issue, you, uh, you, know, you take the issue to these elders. And then if, if they can't solve the problem, then it goes up the ladder, but it's not the government sending. So it's a bottom-up form of government versus top-down. And that's what ancient Israel had. That's what these reformers during the Reformation looked to for this congregational form of church government. And that's what was instituted in colonial America that turned into our constitution. It's we, the people. And this, uh, I just want to say this, that uh, we've got people standing by ready to pray for you. I want to encourage you, please visit Bill Federer's website, American Minute. Uh, the information's on the screen. The book we have been talking about today, Who is the King in America and Who are the Counselors to the King? That's available and subscribe to the American Minute daily email. And uh, that's at AmericanMinute.com. Thank you, Bill, for being with us. We've got more discussions coming. And be sure to call the number on your screen right now. We're standing by, ready to pray for you. We'll see you on the next broadcast. Thank you for watching this video. And be sure to explore more of my YouTube channel for more content like this. And if you want to learn more about what we do, or if you want to partner with us, be sure to visit my website at Mark Coward. Dot org. May the Lord bless you richly.